it's an honor to be with you and to be able to serve you tonight. So we are kicking off a new series called Uncluttered, where we are going to be um, spending the next eight weeks discovering and rediscovering how to really and truly live. Because if we're honest, the way the world would have us live is literally killing us. It's killing us spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. I mean, even the Japanese even have a word for this. It's called kuroshi, and it, which means death by overwork. So you are all invited to take this journey along with us as we together as a church community, as a church family, um, lean into the Jesus way of how we can not only unclutter our lives, but unclutter our souls. So during um, this series, we will be exploring silence and solitude, what simplicity looks like, what it means to Sabbath, slowing down, saying no. Um, yeah, obscurity. And tonight, we are looking at, let me turn this on, hurry and hustle. Let me pray for us. Lord, I sense your presence so strong in here tonight. And so, God, for those of us that are here and those of us under the sound of my voice, God, I just pray that you would have your way. And just like that first song that we sang, um, we want to know you more. We do. I know that's the cry of my heart, desperately. I need you. But so many of us have come in here tonight tired and weary. And so, God, as we hear this message today, tonight, um, it's a hard word. But, God, I pray that through it you would speak and that you would wake us up. Yes, Lord. And so, God, as always, we love and we honor you. Would you have your way, have your way, have your way yes, in this place and in our hearts. And all yes, of God's people said, Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so here's a question for you. What comes into your mind when you think about what the great enemy of spiritual life is in our day? Let me say that again. What comes into our mind when you think about the great enemy of spirit, what the great enemy of spiritual life is in our day? Or to put it another way, what is the greatest challenge you face in being a Jesus follower in New Zealand? I think for a minute. Is it cultural apathy? Is it the tall poppy syndrome? Is it divisions between the denominations? Is it the blurred lines of gender identity? Is it the sexualization of everything? Is it racial injustice? Whatever it is, hold that thought. You know, John Ortberg once asked his mentor theologian, um, Dallas Willard, this question. What do I need to do to become the me that I want to be. Now, John was working at a huge megachurch at the time, was already a hugely successful author, writer, teacher, pastor, a husband, and a father to three young kids. And yet he was floundering and absolutely exhausted. And so he asked Dallas Willard, what do I need to do to become the me that I want to be? And there was this long silence on the other end of the phone. And when Di Dallas finally answered, he said this, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now, John quickly scribbles it down in his journal, and he says, okay, what else? <laughs> Another long silence. And then Dallas says, there is nothing else. Hurry, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now, when John Mark Comer also an author, pastor, teacher of a megachurch, heard that story. It so resounded with him to his very core that he wrote a book with that very title, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Now, this book has not only inspired this series, but it has been messing with my head and my heart, and I'm not alone. And for so many of us here tonight, it has been having its way with us too, so much so that we can't stop talking about it. We talk about it all the time. But I do have a confession to make. This book came onto my radar during the level four lockdown. Um, 
level four lockdown. And when I went to go and purchase it on Amazon to download on my Kindle, it said, you already own this book. <laughs> you see, I had purchased it in 2019, but I had been too busy to read it. Yes, so go figure. So man, I so need this message. I so need this series. And I was saying to Clint, our creative pastor the other day, that I feel like I'm the last person to be talking on this subject or even part of this series. But thank you, Jesus, for his grace and mercy. Amen. I've heard it said that we preach best what we most need to learn how to do. So that's me. So Comer's book is so, so good and so profound that most of my talk is quoting from his book, who is quoting from John Ortberg's book, who is quoting from Dallas Willard's book. <laughs> because when you read all their books, and I did, I was researching just so many, they're all saying the same thing over and over. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You see, studies have shown that hurry is the issue underneath so many of the other issues, like chronic anger, outrage culture, low-grade anxiety, the rise of suicide, mental illness, secularization, violence, materialism, digital distraction, loneliness, exhaustion, burnout, you name it. Case in point, check out, I just Googled a couple of the headlines and these were so jarring, just a couple, because you do any more and it's depressing, but look at this. I'll come to the first one, but let me just go to that second one for a minute. It said, this is true, 2017, report advises UK to assign a minister of loneliness. That's a thing. Because, um, of, because of the internet, we're the most connected and wired up generation ever, but over 10 million Brits claim to feel lonely all the time. And the updated report that I read said that the stats are way higher than that and that nothing has improved but only grown worse. And the other headlines, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation, this is not only a book by Ann Peterson, but a fascinating article to read. Google it. She says this chilling thing in the article um, about speaking of millennials, and she said this, she says, burnout isn't a place to visit and come back from. It's our permanent residence. See, we are living in a culture and pace that is pushing, pushing, pushing us over the edge. Carl Jung, who coined the language introvert and extrovert and whose work was the basis for Meyer Briggs' theory of personality, once said, hurry isn't of the devil, it is the devil. Now, I don't know what comes into your mind when you hear the word devil, but few of us would think that working overtime at our jobs, a string of alerts on our phones, or another activity um, for our kids crammed into an already full week as a life of speed. And yet the effects of hurry and hustle on the soul is absolutely devastating. Comer says that he asked a clinical psychologist once, um, that a clinical psychologist once told him that the number one problem you will face in trying to implement any change and trying to, implement, trying to um, eliminate hurry from your life is time. That most people are just too busy to live an emotionally healthy and spiritually rich life. And psychologists now diagnose people with hurry sickness. That's actually a thing. Um, it's when a person chronically feels short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and will get flustered when they encounter any kind of delay. Now that term, hurry sickness, was diagnosed by a cardiologist who first connected the dots between chronic stress, anger, and heart disease. He defined it as a continuous struggle and this unremitting attempt to accomplish and achieve more and more or to participate in more and more events in less and less time. Now, this cardiologist identified this as a major problem of heart health in the 1950s. Can you believe it? And half a century later, hurry, much like the coronavirus, has spread right through our society. Now, to know if you and I have hurry sickness, raise your hand if you can relate to any of the following statements. Come on. Number one, you go to the grocery store, but you move from one checkout line to another because it's shorter or faster. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about this one? When you come to a traffic light, you count the cars ahead of you and you change lanes. Every day. Every day. Yeah. How about this one? You close the button on an elevator more than once. You press the close button. Yeah. Yeah, right here. Or you push the button at a crosswalk light over and over and over to make it go faster. <laughs> yeah. Like it, like that's going to work. Yeah. I love this one because this is so me. You multitask to the point that you forget one of the tasks. Yeah. And that's even after I've written it down. I can't remember where I put the list. Yeah, so. Now, here's the thing, too. See if you're guilty of any of these. The car is a favorite place for hurry sick people. Hurry sick people in their car will drive, eat, drink coffee, change the playlist on the stereo, shave, apply makeup, talk, and text on the phone, and make gestures all at the same time. I'm pretty sure we all have some form of hurry sickness. Now, the ongoing effect of busyness on our souls and on our society is really starting to take its toll. I mean, just think about it. What is the first thing people say when you ask someone, hey, how's it going, or how are you doing? They say, good, just busy. Yeah. Now, pay attention because you will hear this right across the board. College and uni students are busy. Young parents are busy. Young professionals are busy. The working class are busy. Retired couples are busy. It seems like everybody is busy. Now, let me clarify that these are different types of busy, that there are different types of busy. There's the type of busy where we just have a lot to do and we're not just binging Netflix that you are actually giving your life away to what matters. And by definition, by that def definition, Jesus himself was busy. But there is a far more common type of business that, yes, this is a thing. And that's what I kept saying the whole time. This is a thing. Common type of business that is called pathological busyness, where you don't just have a lot to do, you have way too much to do. So the only way to cram it all in is to speed up our mind and our bodies and our relationships to this frenetic pace to get it all in before the end of the day. But this has all sorts of implications for our emotional health and our spiritual life. Now get this, one survey of 20,000 Christians in the U.S. identified busyness as a major block in people's relationship with God that Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness and hurry and overload, which ultimately leads to a deteriorating relationship with God. And guess what? Pastors in this survey were the worst, and they ranked right up there with doctors and lawyers who were caught up in this vicious cycle. Now you need to buckle up for this next survey. You ready? Because it's going to hurt. But I want you to remember something. I didn't write it. Okay. Now, author Ruth Haley Barton lists 10 signs that you are moving too fast through life. Now, let's see how many you score in. Keep your tally. And remember, just remember, I did not write this. So, 10 signs that you are moving too fast through life. Number one is irritability. You get mad, frustrated, or just annoyed way too easily. Little normal things irk you. People have to tiptoe around your ongoing low-grade negativity, if not anger. Now, to self-diagnose yourself, don't just look at how you treat your colleague or your neighbor. Look at how you treat those closest to you, your spouse, your children, your parents, your flatmate. Yeah. Number two, hypersensitivity. All it takes is a minor comment to hurt your feelings, a grumpy email to set you off, um, or a little turn of events to throw you into an emotional funk and ruin your day. Minor things quickly escalate to major emotional events, and depending on your personality, this might show up as anger or nitpickiness or anxiety and depression or just tiredness. The point is, the ordinary problems of life have a disproportionate effect on your emotional well-being and relational grace. You just can't seem to roll with the punches. How are we doing? Yeah. Number three, restlessness. When you actually do try to slow down and rest, you just can't relax. 
You give Sabbath a try and you hate it. You read scripture, but you find it boring. You have a quiet time with God, but just can't focus your mind. You go to bed early, but toss and turn with anxiety. You watch TV and simultaneously check your phone, fold your laundry, stalk someone on Facebook, and answer emails. Yeah, Come on. Okay, next one. I told you. Workaholism or just nonstop activity. You just don't know when to stop. Or worse, you can't stop. Um, you can't stop. Another hour, another day, another week, your drugs of choice are accomplishment and accumulation. And these could show up as careerism or just obsessive house cleaning or errand running. Yeah. Result, you fall prey. And this made me sad when I read this. Result is you fall prey to sunset fatigue. The sunset fatigue is where by the day's end, you have nothing left to give to your spouse, your children, or your loved ones. They get the grouchy, overtired you. Yeah. How about this one? Emotional numbness. You just don't have the capacity to feel another person's pain, or your own pain for that matter. Empathy is a rare feeling for you. You, don't, you just don't have time for it. You live in this kind of constant fatigue. Number six, out of order priorities. You feel disconnected from your identity and calling. You're always getting, getting sucked into the tyranny of the urgent, not the important. Your life is reactive, not proactive. You're busier than ever before, but still feel like you don't have enough time for what really matters to you. And months go by, or years, and God forbid, maybe, maybe even it's decades, and you realize that you still haven't gotten around to all the things you said were most important to your life. Lack of care for your body. Yes, this is going to hurt. You don't have time for the basics. Eight hour, you don't have the time for the basics of eight hours of sleep a night. And just a side note, prior to the invention of the light bulb, people regularly slept 11, 12 hours a night. Amazing. I guess there's only so much you can do by candlelight, yep. So you don't have time for daily exercise or healthy home-cooked food, so you gain weight. Um, you get sick multiple times a year. You regularly wake up tired. You don't sleep well, and you live off caffeine, sugar, processed carbs, and alcohol. And then, here's another one that kind of got me. You hoard energy. You feel like you just can't get too involved with this person or that thing because you have to be ready for the next thing. How about this one? Escapist behaviors. When we're too tired to do what actually is life-giving for our souls, we turn to our distraction of choice. Overeating, over-drinking, binge-watching, TV, gaming, browsing social media, surfing the web, looking at porn. Name your preferred acceptable cultural narcotic. And then this one. We're almost done. Slippage of spiritual disciplines. And when you get over busy, the things that are truly life-giving for your soul are the, soul are the first to go rather than your first go-to. Time with God, reading scripture, prayer, Sabbath, worship on Sunday, life groups, and meals with your communities, and so on. They just go out the door. Because in an ironic catch-22, the things that make for rest actually take a bit of emotional energy and self-discipline to plan. And when we get overtired and over busy, so instead of life with God, we settle for life with a Netflix or a TV subscription or Disney Plus or whatever it is, and a glass of wine, and it's a poor substitute. And not because that TV is the great Satan, but because we rarely get done binge watching anything or um, posting on social media or gaming or overeating and feel awake and alive and rested and refreshed and feel really close to God in that moment. No. And number 10, and we've kind of touched on this already, isolation. You feel disconnected from God, others, and your own soul. And on those rare times when you actually stop to pray, and by pray, you don't ask God for stuff. You, you um, just sit with God in the quiet you're so stressed and distracted that your mind just can't settle down long enough to enjoy your father's company. And same with your friends. 
when you're with them, you're also on your phone or a million miles away in your mind, running down your to-do list. And even when you are alone, you come face to face with the void that is in your soul and you immediately run back to the familiar groove of busyness and digital distraction. Okay, now do the math. How did you score? (laughs) Now, please hear me, church. I did not read that list to bring any guilt or shame on anyone because I'm with you. Like, I didn't score very well on a lot of these. But it's more of a wake-up call for us. And it's like that saying where you ask a goldfish, hey, how's the water? And they say, what's water? We are so immersed and used to hurry and hustle that we're not even aware of its effect on us. You see, there's more at stake here than just our emotional health. Reality is some people can, some people can live their lives at a frenetic pace, but you wonder if it's a compassionate and loving life. Now, a Catholic writer, Ronald Ron Rollhauser, says this, and I thought it was really profound. He says, we... For every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these things. It's just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall, and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are in church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. And can we just talk for a minute about distraction? You know, in our history classes when we were in school, we would have learned that during the Middle Ages, the year 1440 was the year that changed the world. It was the year that the printing press was invented, which set the stage for the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment, which totally transformed Europe and the world. But when the history books are written, and they will point to 2007 as the climax and infection point that is on par with 1440. What was introduced to the world in 2007? Anybody guess? Yeah, the iPhone, (laughs) the iPhone. 2007 was also the same year Facebook opened up to anybody with an email, the year Twitter became its own platform, year one of the cloud, along with the App Store, the year Intel switched from silicon to metal chips, and a list of other technological breakthroughs, all right around the year 2007, the official start date of the digital age. Now, the world has changed dramatically in just a few short years because we can not even imagine now life without Wi-Fi. And the internet has put our smartphones and the world right in our front pocket. And check this out. Check this out. A recent study found that the average iPhone user or smartphone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day. (laughs) Another book that is totally wrecking me is Subversive Sabbath by A.J. Swoboda. And in it, he says that every night, one-third of teenagers stop sleeping to check their phones for social media, checking messages, or texting on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. And we wonder why teenagers are committing suicide at such a high rate. It's because they're not sleeping. And another terrifying trend is that our attention span is actually dropping with each passing year. In the year 2000, before the digital revolution, it was 12 seconds. So it's not like we had a lot to work with. But since then, it's dropped to eight seconds. And to put it in perspective, a goldfish has the attention span of nine seconds. So yes, it's true, we are losing to goldfish. You know, John Orberg, and I love him, he's such a great writer, said that for many of us, the great danger of and for our spiritual lives is not that we will renounce our faith, it's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it, that we will just skim through our lives instead of actually living them. 
Church, I believe God is calling us to live in a different way. He's calling us to love in a different way. And what kills our capacity to receive and give love in relationship with God and others is hurry sickness. And here's the thing. Hurry sickness is incompatible with love. It's like oil and water. They just don't mix. And there's this little book by this Japanese theologian called Three Mile an Hour God. Apparently three miles an hour is the speed of walking. Now listen to the language this writer, this Japanese writer puts around it. He says this. God walks slowly because he is love. He is not, if he were not love, he would have gone much faster. You see, love has its speed. It is an inner speed. It's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It is slow, yet it is Lord over all the other speeds since it is the speed of love. Let that just sink in for a minute. That is the reason why we talk about um, walking with God, not hurrying with God. That's why we talk about waiting on God, not running with God. And we see this pace on display so beautifully in the life of Jesus. And when you read the Gospels, Jesus was rarely, if ever, in a hurry. He's so present to the moment so present in every encounter. He was present to his own soul and what was going on inside of him and outside of him. He was present to the soul of the woman or the man right in front of him, present to people in need and not just the high energy person or the important person or the status person, but to the woman in the back and his responses, who touched me? Jesus was so present to what God was doing in the moment that he said, I always see and do what the Father is doing. He's so present to the here and the now. And if you pay attention to the teachings of Jesus, what you will notice is how many of them are responses to interruptions. C.S. Lewis said, how you respond to an interruption is who you really are. Yeah. (laughs) It's in those interruption moments when we are unguarded, when we don't know what to say, and we don't have time to craft a really clever text um, message response. It's who we are right there in that moment of interruption and all our frustration, insecurities, fear, anger, love. And for Jesus, he responded with compassion, wisdom, presence, and with love whenever he was interrupted. And Jesus is calling you and I as his followers to slow down to that loving kind of speed of relationship. See, in Matthew chapter 11, now imagine hearing this for the very, very first time. It says this, and you'll know it well. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now listen how Eugene Peterson says it in the message version. Are you tired, worn out, burned out in religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And I love this. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Don't you love that? Jesus' message is so, so good because it is one of rest, real rest. And notice what Jesus isn't saying here. Come to me, and I will make you a, a great success. Success. Come to me and I'll heap a bunch of religious commandments on you. No, salvation is about rest. The way of Jesus is anchored and rooted in rest. You see, Jesus was a rabbi. And rabbi was a Hebrew word for teacher. And like any rabbi in his day, Jesus had two things. First, he had a yoke. And not a literal yoke because he's a, he's a, um, a teacher, not a farmer. A yoke was a common idiom 
in the first century for a rabbi's way of reading the Torah, the Holy Scriptures. But it was also more than that. It was his set of teachings on how to be human. His way to shoulder the at times crippling weight of life of marriage and divorce and prayer, money, sex, conflict resolution, government, all of it. It's an odd image for those of us who don't live in that kind of agrarian culture or farming culture. But imagine two oxen yoked together to pull a cart or to plow a field. A yoke is how you shoulder the load. And what made Jesus unique wasn't that he had a yoke. All the rabbis had a yoke. It was that he had an easy yoke. And secondly, Jesus had apprentices. The Hebrew word is talmudim. And it's usually translated as disciples, but an even better word to capture the idea, the idea behind Taladim is apprentices. And to be one of Jesus' Talmudim is to apprentice under him. Put simply, it's to organize your life around three basic goals. To be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what he would do if he were you. The whole point of being an apprentice is to model your life after Jesus. Craig talked about this on Good Friday. And in doing so, to recover your soul, to have that warped part of you put back into shape, to experience healing in the deepest part of your being, to experience what Jesus called in John 10.10, life to the full. Now, in John Tyson's book, Beautiful Resistance, Another must read, you guys. It's such a good book. In it, he says that Jesus intends for you and I to live life to the full. That this is not the prosperity gospel. This is the actual gospel. Now, this is Jesus contrasting that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that he comes to give life. That he is the good shepherd. That life under Jesus is intended to be life to the full. But how we normally recover is this. When we are so done and have worked ourselves for an extended period of time or season to the point of utter exhaustion, and we actually come and take a rest and take time to recover, how much of that life do we actually recover that Jesus intends for us? We may get back to managing our exhaustion, but we rarely do we really get all that back, the life to the full thing. What gets lost in the gap? Here's what we lose. We lose joy and peace and sustainability, calling, wonder, kindness, peace, and love. And do you know where sacrificial agape love lives and manifests itself? is when you and I are full, full of God's love, full of God's spirit, and not when we're half empty. Because when we're empty, we don't have the margin to even love. We don't have margin to be present to the moment. We barely have enough energy for our own lives. It's like that gadget that you always grab for, but when you do, it's always flat or out of batteries. And I think for some of us, our Christian walks are like that. Every time God wants to use us, we're just out of batteries. That's why rest and slowing down is essential to discipleship. It's not optional. This is not an optional thing for the Jesus follower. Jesus urged his disciples to take time out, Following Jesus cannot be done at a sprint. And if we want to follow someone, we can't go faster than the one who's leading. We must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. And this does not mean that we will never be busy. Jesus often had much to do, but he never did it in a way that severed the life-giving relationship between him and his father. He never did it in a way that interfered with his ability to give love, Um, when love is called for, he observed a regular practice of withdrawing from activity for the sake of solitude and prayer. And we're going to get into all of this during the series, so you don't want to miss one. But Jesus was often busy, never hurried. You see, hurried is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered heart. Jesus' invitation to take up his yoke to travel through life at his side, learning from him how to shoulder the weight of life with ease, to step out of the burnt out society is to find life, is to find life of soul rest. I'm going to invite the worship team to come out now. You know, that passage that I read in Matthew 11 of Jesus um, saying to us, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burden, 
And he says that my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Those verses are so familiar to us, but the danger is that it's easy to grow really numb and even blind to what's embedded, the beauty that's embedded in these verses. See, hidden in plain sight is the invitation um, of Jesus to what Dallas Willard called the secret of the easy yoke. And he says this. Now, the secret of the easy yoke is this. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. We are to take on his habits and practices. And as an apprentice, we are to copy our rabbi's every move. After all, that's the whole point of being an apprenticeship. That's what Jesus is getting at with that odd imagery of the yoke, which when you think about it is a is bizarre language for an invitation to find rest for your souls. I mean, yokes are for farming. Farming is work, not rest. But listen to this other quote on the easy yoke. A yoke is a work instrument. Thus, when Jesus offers a yoke, he offers what, he, what we might think tired workers need least. They need a mattress and a vacation, not a yoke. But Jesus realizes that the most restful gift that he can give the tired is a new way to carry life, a fresh way to bear responsibilities and carry our humanity. And how is that? It's right by his side like two oxen in a field tied shoulder to shoulder, with Jesus doing all the heavy lifting at his pace, slow, unhurried, present to the moment, full of love and joy and peace. An easy life is not an option. Life is hard, full stop, no question. But an easy yoke is. And my prayer, our prayer, for you during the series is that you and I together would learn that the Jesus pace of life for in doing so is actually saving your life. Amen. Now the team, I'm we're going to sing surrender. What I would love. And I was kind of thinking this when I was down below in that beautiful worship moment. And we sang, I surrender. I thought we could kind of do something to kind of end this. And then, the band will sing and we can really engage in it. But I would love you to just close your eyes, everybody. The Quakers used to have this way of praying and it so came to my mind so strongly. So I feel to do this. The Quakers had a way of praying where they would actually um, put out their hands with their palms down. So do that now. Put out your hands with your palms down. Now it was their posture during prayer to start surrendering things, letting things go. I don't know what God is asking you to let go of in this moment, but let him speak to you. What do you need to let go? Where are you being blocked from living the pace of Jesus? Let him speak to you. And then what they would do is that they would turn their hands upward, put your palms up. And this is where you receive what God has for you. Blessing. (laughs) Rest. Rest for your weary soul. Receive from your Father who loves you, who longs to spend time with you. We just need to be still enough to let him minister to those broken places in our hearts. Receive from your Father. He loves you. He sees you. He knows what your preferred distractions are. He knows it all. But he's with you and he says, come. Come to me. I'm just going to read that verse one more time. And then I'll invite you to stand and sing. Are you tired, worn out? burned out on religion, then come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely 
and lightly. Yes, 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 and amen.